I have come to talk to you about two long words which express what I really want to uh, explain as a start. Before I get on to my slides of flowers and plants, I would like to explain to you two principles which are very basic to the whole of ecology. The first one, which affects our bees very strongly, is co-evolution. Our bees, and in fact all bees and all pollinators, have evolved along with plants. As I'm sure you know, plants were on the planet first. In fact, they came out of the oceans. Did you know that there are actually pollinating plants inside the ocean? I always thought that was a very strange thing when I discovered that. But of course, those early pollens were swept around by currents of water or currents of air, wind. And those early plants were called gymnosperms because, which actually in Latin, or I should say Greek, means uh, naked sperm. And those naked sperm were released by the plant into the wind. Just as you see pine, pines today, you know in May, you walk among the pines and there's often yellow dust blowing in the wind. There was obviously a, a great investment being made by the plant in that pollen. But it was being rather prodigally sent abroad to hopefully find a female to mate with. And I have to say to you, that process was hit and miss at best, as we all know. It has also brought up this idea of co-evolution, things de developing together. We don't really understand exactly why plants very brilliantly decided or found a way of producing actual attractants so that cr other creatures, which are mobile, because plants, of course, are mainly fixed, but the, the mobile creatures could actually carry the pollen around for them. And those which are flowering plants are called angiosperms. And they developed, in fact, several million years after the original gymnosperms. The effect was an enormous increase in biodiversity among the plants. And of course, an equally large and amazing biodiversity started among the insects. And it's because of that that we have a planet that we recognize as a place we can live. It really is as simple as that. If we do not have pollinators, we don't really have a place to live ourselves. So there's my big threat to you. I would like to introduce now the second idea, which is a little curious and can be a little misleading. But it is a beautiful idea, and it's not alien to what we've just been talking about with co-evolution. It is the idea of mutualism. Mutualism in uh, botany and in, in biology is a strange symbiosis usually between two species. So I'll give you a little example from the bees, and it's a, it's a kind of interesting one. There are some euglossine bees, these are tiny solitary bees in California, which actually pollinate orchids. You've probably heard of these amazing little bees, because the orchid seems to have developed a particular kind of smell, a scent, which the bee can uh, uh, get onto her or his, I should say, because it's a male bee, onto his body, and which is attractive to female bees. So these little euglossine bees have developed a method of using the actual uh, fragrance of the orchid in order to attract his own mate. Now, the orchid in return has developed something which is even more bizarre. The Orchid has developed, you know that lower lip you have on an orchid flower and how difficult it is to imagine anybody getting into it. But this little tiny euglossine bee actually can get into it and he knows just where to get his face to get the scent that he wants. And doesn't the orchid drop on his head its own pollen, pollinia, right? Which is its pollinating part. Drops it right on his head where it sticks. You know that pollens are often quite sticky. 
And there it sticks. So when he goes to the next one for a little more of this delicious scent, doesn't he pollinate the orchid? Now, that is mutualism. So it's, it's the, if you like, there are sort of three steps. Mutualism would be this highly refined codependency almost of particular species. Needn't be just one species, but that was a particular example. And then you have this broad church of co-evolution, of things developing together, and the, the evolutionary niches that they have enable them to survive. They know how to use what is there. Both the plant species and the animal species are working together in that way. And then, obviously, there are the gymnosperms still throwing out their pollen as if there was no tomorrow. So I think I would stick, if you don't mind, with the idea of how this is creating biodiversity and this co-evolutionary idea. Actually, it is terribly important. Um, we are losing species at a terrible rate at the moment, including, I think, from our point of view, a large number of insect species, many of which we haven't yet begun to identify. We're already losing them. Now, bees have been on the planet, as you know, much, much longer than we have. I think the oldest one I've found to talk about is actually, uh, I'm sure you've seen the picture, Miletta Spex uh, burmiensis, found in Burmese amber. And it's thought to be well over 100,000, oh, sorry, let me say 100 million years old, which is an enormous ex ex uh, increase in the amount of time that we thought there were possible pollinators on the, on the planet. Now, Melitus vex is actually about halfway between a wasp and a bee. So it clearly, as we can see in the amber, it clearly is um, a, re a relative of both in our modern world. It's a relative of the wasp in that it has the uh, typical uh, sting-like quality, you know, the sting-like um, <coughs> what would you describe it as, um, uh, apparatus. We, in our bees, it's all the ovipositor, obviously. Um, uh, and, but it is also got branched hairs. And that's the critical bit. The branched hairs are a sign that it is developing to pick up pollen. I told you pollen was sticky. <laughs> that ability to pick up and use pollen is uh, absolutely critical to this whole increase in the number of species that we see around. And the, the book that I would like to mention to you, if you're interested in this aspect of things, where I get my examples from, like those lovely little Euglossian bees, um, is a, a book called The Forgotten Pollinators. Um, I will mention it again. It's by a man called Stephen Buc uh, Buckman, B-U-C-H-M-A-N-N. -N. Don't worry, I can give you the list at the end. Um, and I've learned so much from it. And in particular, I learned to be very, very anxious about the loss of species, particularly because of something which is known as, I don't know if you've heard of this, the Allais effect, after the man who first defined it, A-double-L-E-E-E-E-Q-T-E. -E 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 uh, the Allais effect is a very, very serious problem. I'll read you what it said. When a population drops below a certain threshold, it can no longer support its ecological associates, and it loses viability. So now this is about how the whole system is dependent on all the members. I'll give you an example, again, going from my book, The Forgotten Pollinators. Um, this is an odd one because this isn't the sort of pollinator that you expect me to talk about. This is actually a little pollinator, which is a honey possum in Australia. This is uh, the loss that we know has happened of a very beautiful, very rare banksia, um, known as Goods banksia, which is endemic to Western Australia only. And it was quite a rare plant when it was first identified. And it was interesting because it's, it's unusual in that it is, well, I say unusual. A lot of banksias are actually pollinated by possums and other little animals, right? They like the sweetness. And this was 
was in fact pollinated by a little glider possum called a honey possum because she loved to get her nose right into the Banksia flowers and grub them up, and that's how the thing was, was pollinated. Unfortunately, uh, we, mankind, the motoring public, put a road right through the area where these little, uh, these beautiful Banksias grew and the honey possums were the pollinators. And the effect was to isolate the, the, the clumps of the Banksias. At this stage, the possums found, you know, it wasn't really worth their while trying to get across the road to the other clump of, of the Banksias. And so what happened literally was that the pollinators quite simply ceased to bother with this plant because the road <laughs> had cut up the environment so badly that it was actually impossible for the plants to get properly pollinated. Now that which caused the Allais effect, that caused the extinction of Goods Banksia, is happening everywhere. It is happening in our landscape everywhere. We keep on making vast areas of monocrop, oilseed rape, only grass, all wheat, obviously. It's not very much used to pollinators. All of these isolate the populations of the native pollinators that we have. They isolate them and slowly reduce them beyond the point that they can recover. This is how extinctions happen. And this is what is happening in our landscapes. Dale was talking to you a minute ago about the difficulty of the urban garden. But I think it could be true to say, much as I regret to say it, I, obviously I'm from Ireland, even in Ireland where, in fact, I think we probably are very lucky to have a good, uh, a good percentage of really wild-looking kind of landscape. Um, even there, I regularly say to people, actually, bees, honeybees do better in the suburbs. And they do better in the suburbs for one simple reason, which is that gardeners, like ourselves, like flowers, right? We like flowers, bees like flowers, and that is the friendship that I'm talking about. The friendship between flowers and bees. The, the suburban garden typically has a long period of having flowers which are available to pollinators. And that is the magic, is to have flowers, if you possibly can, all year. The last thing I want to say from my little sort of preaching at you is really to quote a man that I, I am very fond of, an American entomologist uh, called Eric Grissel, who wrote a book called um, Insects and Gardens. And he's a generalist. He's not particular uh, to bees. But he does say that a garden which has a very large number of different kinds of species in it that is a healthy garden. And a garden which has few species is an unhealthy garden, as far as he's concerned. An example I can give you of this is a terrible thing that happened in China in the, in the time of Chairman Mao. They identified a villainous creature that was decimating their crops. It was the common sparrow. And Chairman Mao sent out an edict that everybody was to kill sparrows. If you found a nest, you were to squash the eggs. You shoot them. You beat them down. And they got rid of a lot of sparrows. In fact, they almost, you don't see a, a, a sparrow nowadays in China virtually at all. Or oh, here, really. We're losing them. At the end of that, these villainous creatures, which were identified as the problem, had in fact been taking quite a lot of insects off the flipping crops. The birds had been protecting the crops and having, of course, because they're omnivorous, as you know, grain as well. And the analysis was so narrow that it caused a total disaster in the agriculture. This is what we must guard against. We must guard against thinking we know it all. 
You need to observe everything in the environment, even to begin to understand the intricacy, the dependency of every little bit on the other things. I'm not going to get onto worms, don't worry, <laughs> much as I love them. If it's all right with you, I think I'd better start onto my slides, because I really would like to talk to you about all these plants. Now, I have to be quite plain. I'm a frightful gardener. My garden is a heap. I don't mind it being much of a heap. Um, I don't uh, worry about weeds very much, but I do try to plant things which cope with weeds, right? <laughs> and things which cope with weeds are often shrubs and trees. So one of the things that I do is I make sure, I really do make sure that there is a tree in flower in my garden every month of the year. It's not impossible, it's not even difficult to do. It may challenge you a wee bit, but of course the, the advantages of having a tree in flower at every month of the year are that you get the beautiful scents. Most of the trees that attract our pollinators are beautifully scented. And a tree has more blossom than anything else you can imagine. Now, I don't suppose you've got room. Uh, we're all suburban gardeners. I don't suppose you've got room for a massive chestnut tree. But the little one I have on the screen is not a bad start. Now, I call it a tree. It isn't really, of course. It's a shrub. It's Verburnum bodnantensi. I have a list of all my things. Don't worry. I can give you the list after. This is bodnantensi dawn. I'm sure you all know it. Um, that is going to come into flower in December. And if any of our bees are out in December, which we know they may well be, remember those funny little warm patches you get sometimes around Christmas? And you look at the bees and you think, you poor dears, what are you going to eat? You need some pollen, you need some nectar. Well, viburnums are excellent. Many of the viburnums flower in the winter. I've given you Bodnantensi dawn because she is such a beautiful plant. But the ordinary viburnum tinus, the white one, evergreen, beautiful shrub, you work, that doesn't have a scent, will give you berries in the autumn. That one the bees love as well. It really is a super plant. So around Christmas, I'm always looking. <laughs> I'm always looking to give the bees a treat. Philip McCabe used to say, <laughs> you give the bees a treat at Christmas. What he meant was, that you give them a slab of, of uh, fondant, which I do. But my idea of giving them a treat at Christmas is to have something in flower at Christmas. Now, if you're living in a really cold area, north of Norfolk, or somewhere which is really exposed, this plant probably won't be for you, though it is, in fact, Tibetan. And can I just see if I can flick? There I go. I'm just wondering, does anybody recognize this? Daphne Balua, Jacqueline Postil. Absolutely. This is the star of my garden for about two months in the depth of the winter. She's a big, untidy bush now. I've had her for many years. I call her a bee magnet. Sorry, I always refer to plants as she. I don't know why. I think it's just affectionate. As you can see from my picture, Already that bee is able to collect a tiny amount of pollen. She's only just got started. But there's also nectar. The, all the Daphnes are very good and very early. The native, if you are living in a, a cold area and you're worried about this, I don't know quite why I'm worried about it. I know she's Tibetan. She should manage anywhere. But I don't like to recommend something without being 100%. So, but on the other hand, give it a go, right? Um, so all the Daphnes are super, and all of them are pretty early. The native one is Daphne Mazarion, and that will come into flower in February for you, more or less, wherever you are. I ought to tell you, one sprig of this Daphne taken into the house will scent the whole room, and it's a really sweet and beautiful perfume. It's a most wonderful plant. And this year, to my amazement, didn't I get it to have some berries on? And they have, they've sprouted. So I have had three or four new Daphne Balluas, probably not Jacqueline Postil, right? I've had three or four actually grow. So it's not a difficult plant, but again, just let me warn you in case of really terrible conditions. 
here it is again. Now, I took this picture. Actually, can I zoom in, please? I took this picture to show you that it was a popular plant, <laughs> right? As you can see, I've had, actually, two Christmases ago, I saw a, a beautiful red-tailed bumblebee on this plant in the depth of the winter. I couldn't believe my eyes. God knows what she was doing out at that time. But there we have, and that, that photo will show you that there is a proper pollen crop. There is actually a crop which is useful. It's not uh, minimal at all. They can stuff their thighs with that. So that's Daphne Balua. There we go. This is another one which is flowering in January, will go all the way through February. And this is a great untidy bush, but, and it doesn't do anything at the rest of the year. So I've planted it in an area of the garden that I don't need to look at later. Actually, it happens to be hiding my beehive, which is brilliant. <laughs> right? Um, this is Lonicera fragrantissima. And I got the reference to plant this from an old gardener's question time. I'm sure you remember the old gardener's question time when they used to say, oh, it's a lovely plant, right? <laughs> and I think it was somebody like Bill Sauerbutz who said, oh, I go for Lonicera fragrantissima. So I hunted around. And I've had it for years and years. It is a fail-safe plant, hardy as nails. And as you can see from my little bee, you can get a really decent pollen and nectar uh, crop from this plant. Now, I warn you, it is untidy. It will shoot out in all directions, but it doesn't mind being cut. The leaves are of no particular interest, and it does nothing else except this. So stick it in a corner where you just like some green, and leave it to go for February. After it's flowered, obviously, you can cut it down. This I'm sure you all have, and I needn't really recommend. But again, I can't resist taking two bees if they're close together. This is Mahonia X Charity. Um, smells of lily of the valley. A darling plant, again, not tidy. Very hardy. I haven't seen, I, I have seen more bumblebees on it actually than honeybees of recent days. I don't know quite why. My bees aren't very interested in it. All the plants that I'm talking to you uh, about are within 20 yards of my, of my hive in the garden. So I can always watch. Oh, yes. This is another January picture. You are quite at liberty to disbelieve me. This insane plant is Lavandula dentata. Can you see the leaves? They're sort of a bit odd. They're kind of indented. It's Lavandula dentata, which means toothed, literally. This refuses to stop flowering. <laughs> it flowers solidly all year. Now, I have to say, it is not a fully hardy plant. The reason I liked it and bought it, found it on a market, was that I remembered it from living in Australia. And there, of course, it, it flourishes all over the place and flowers all the time. But you wouldn't be surprised everything flowers all the time in Australia. But in Bray, County Wicklow, <laughs> right, I was dead surprised to see that it actually uh, was very happy. And I've taken enormous numbers of cuttings. It's an extremely easy plant. If you have a plant you're worried about over the winter, Obviously, what you do is you take cuttings and make sure you don't lose it. So if you lose the main plant, you've still got to start again. So any lavender will always come from cuttings. It's really not a problem. So lavender dentata, lavandula dentata is a scruffy lavender. When I mention it to gardeners, they say, Ugh. oh, lavender dentata, yes. No, we don't bother with that. We go for Sturcus, the beautiful French lavenders. We go for fancy ones or we go for the splendid English ones, but they flower and finish, as we all know. I do not understand this plant. It simply cannot be stopped. I have more or less a hedge of it at this stage. So that is a recommendation for anybody willing to try their hand. I do warn you, it is not fully hardy, but if you've got a sheltered spot that you don't mind, a rather scruffy lavender, she'll do, she'll do for your bees at every point in the year. Ah, you notice I'm still in the depths of the winter. Does anybody recognize this? 
Yeah, absolutely, it is. It's my freckles. Clematis cirrhosa freckles. Become a great, great friend. Oh, I do admire this plant. I don't suppose you can really see, but this plant, which flowers from late January through to the end of February, um, sometimes longer, is a favorite of all the bees, as you can see, both pollen and nectar. It's a sweet thing, not showy, not a big flower. Uh, a flower so big, usually. And the reason I admire this plant extravagantly, quite apart from the fact that it's so good for my bees, it's the only thing I've ever come across which is strong enough to contend with ivy. <laughs> you won't believe me. I have a ludicrous fence at that angle, which my husband likes. I don't know why he likes it at that angle, but it does. And it's at that angle because it's completely covered with ivy. And my Clematis rosa is at the corner of that, originally, of course, it's an old plant now. But that Clematis goes over the top of the ivy in the winter. So the ivy goes into flower, finishes, and tries to bury. At this stage, it gets totally buried under the leaves of Clematis cirrhosa. Couldn't believe it. You've had the same experience. Isn't she strong? <laughs> so if you want a really strong plant that's going to be flowering for you in February, watch out. Clematis cirrhosa will do it. I might even have another picture of that. There we are. This is Clematis cirrhosa again. And I took this picture. That's Bombus lapidarius. As I said, she shouldn't be out at that time of the year. Um, even the Bombus terrestris, the earth bees, hadn't really come out at this stage. But she was hungry, and out she popped. And luckily, she had Clematis cirrhosa. Back to Lunicera fragrantissima. And I'm going to zoom in on this again once more. This is really to show you they're still, it's still flowering a month after the first photograph. This one, as you can see, is completely covered in pollen. At that stage of the year, it really is so valuable for the bees to be getting fresh pollen. I know it sounds daft. We know how wonderfully they adapt in other countries. But if they're disturbed, and they always are disturbed with a mild spell, then they do need to eat. They really do. And sugar is all very well, but a little good protein doesn't go amiss. <laughs> Still flowering, but Viburnum bonantensi. And this one I took because, again, I could see the pollen sacs were filling up. I won't trouble you with that again. Oh, and Clematis still. I'm oh, sorry, this is just me being proud of my plants. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we're coming nearly into March now. And this is another very early bush that really does help. You can grow this as a small tree. It's actually a very elegant tree. It's Amelanchia canadensis, and it is a very nice uh, early flowering little, little tree. Um, mine is more or less grown just as a shrub. I haven't bothered to, to give it a, a proper stem. Um, but it will do a stem if you want it to. Hardy as nails, canadensis from Canada, no problem about it. And what it does, which is really nice, is it, it has the most beautiful autumn color as well. So it really is a two for one. You get this lovely early flush of, of blossom. I always take some sprigs into the house. And it's not, now that one is not, not heavily, in fact, it's hardly scented. But later on in the year, you get this lovely reward again of the beautiful fire red, lovely red foliage. That's a nice plant, and easy, really easy. I just don't think any of these plants are likely to be terribly difficult. Another easy thing, flowers all the time. I'm sure you all know it. Erisimum bull's mauve. It's the perennial wallflower. Bull's mauve is a darling. All, all that perennial wallflowers, uh, I'm sure you have one in your garden in flower at the minute. I do. Um, flowers all the summer, flowers almost all the winter. Sometimes I cut its heads off and it sort of stops flowering for a little bit. But it's, a, again, um, so simple to take cuttings. If you want to keep it tidy, right, then start again. Right? So let it go for a bit. Make it do its flowering thing. Take a cutting. Very, very easy for cuttings. And plant a new plant if you get tired of the old one because it's too leggy. Just like the lavender. OK? Right. Ah. Oh. Doing my bit for wildflowers. <laughs> we
We cannot do without dandelions. Here we are in March. Dandelions are essential. If you ever root up a dandelion, you are to blame. I hope you know that. <laughs> Actually, it can be quite a lot of work to root up a dandelion. I have some with... <laughs> yes. Dandelions are very, very good, as I'm sure you all know. What we see as a single flower is, in fact, hundreds of flowers. Each one of those, what we call petals, is in fact an individual flower. If you think of the way the dandelion clock forms all those seeds, effectively, that's each fertilized little flower, right? So what the bees and other pollinators can get from dandelions is not just what they get from a flower with petals. It's actually about 400% better in terms of the rewards that they can get. So don't be miserable. Have some dandelions in your garden, enjoy them, and mow them out when they're finished. Ah, yes. Yes. This is another kind of a, a plant that I made a, a, a serious mistake with, really. <laughs> As you can see, it's, it's the white form of comfrey. And I let it seed, right? Which I should never have done. However, the great thing about letting it seed was I'll never be without it, right? <laughs> and that has an amazingly long flowering period. I don't think, I, I mean, I, I grew it from seed originally, so it was a scatter. But the fact of the matter is that really that will flower for months as a sequence if you just let it seed around a little bit. So somewhere in your herb garden where you're not desperate to, to make the, you know, the crop there's room for white comfrey, and white comfrey, it's a nice plant, but, or any comfrey. I just happened to pick up a packet of white ones because I hadn't come across them. Um, if, you, if you can make room for things which will go on flowering over a long period, obviously you can see I'm here into April, there's a little apple blossom behind. Um, yes? Isn't that white borage? Oh, yes, you're right, it's borage. My apologies, yes, you're quite right. The comfrey's the bell. My apologies, she's quite right. Thank you very much. I always confuse the two. Of course, they're very closely related and all in the same family. And I probably confuse them for a good reason. I don't know if you can see in that picture that there are some small blue flowers. I will show you those small blue flowers again. I'll, I'll return to that. Those small blue flowers, I'm ashamed to say, are alkanet. Alkanet is a pernicious weed. Its roots are this long. It is the devil. It has a beautiful blue flower, and the bees adore it. <laughs> However, we all know that bees don't like rhododendrons, so there's one to prove it. <laughs> you wouldn't plant rhododendrons for a bee. But you know yourself, if there is a, a, a harvest to be had, the bees will find it. They are totally brilliant. And that rhododendron, which I just planted because I liked it, and it's a reasonably old tree now, that in, in April gives me a lot of pleasure. And to my astonishment, the bumblebees actually use it quite a bit. And occasionally, a wandering bee drops in for a little bit. Apple blossom, I don't need to recommend to you. Yes. And there's the alkanet tucked down at the bottom. I really have to talk to you about that. It's a monster. Ceanothus. This one is a, quite a tall shrub. Ceanothus thysifolius. And it is covered and smothered in flowers. Um, usually May, where we are. Um, when I started with this, I wasn't sure it was fully hardy. I'm pretty sure it is now. Of course, it's known as Californian lilac. I think that's what put the doubt in my mind. Um, there are lots and lots of beautiful Ceanothus plants, the blue bush, and I think the bees love them all. And you can see why. Just look at the number of flowers on that, on each head. These are hugely uh, dense clusters of flowers. Absolutely, a, a, again, a magnet for the bees. Um, th this plant is weird. Uh, I, I planted it when I first moved over to Ireland, which is nearly 40 years ago. I planted it, and it grew, and, um, 
And after a while, about after when it got to be about 35 years old, it started to get very miserable, and I realized it was dying. And it realized it was dying. And for the very first time, it put up berries. And it replanted itself. <laughs> you never know with plants. They're astounding. Ah, yes. Now, this is a sad picture and a dreadful warning about the kind of gardening I do. This poor bee, as you can see, has fallen prey to an evil crab spider, that white spider. <laughs> they leap on them, tie them up, and, and eat them, of course. But the plant is Mechanopsis cambrica, the Welsh poppy. If you have one in your garden, you'll have it forever. These are very, they seed everywhere. My aunt, my dear aunt, who was a great gardener, used to describe them as thugs. <laughs> and it's a good description. But again, the bees love them. These are virtually wildflowers. If you have a patch that you're not keen on and you don't care about, throw a few seeds of Mechanopsis cambrica. There's the yellow form there, and there's one called Francis Perry, which is an orange form. Both beautiful and refreshing. Refreshing for bees. That poor bee had obviously been working hard. She has pollen in her sacs. But alas, the crab spider was there too. Yes, I'm sure you know this, and maybe you know the bee. Can somebody identify the bee? Yes. OK, well, I'm a bumble lover. <laughs> I adore bumbles. This is Bombus pasquorum, which I call the ginger bee. Very common bee, one of the six common bees, bumblebees. And I took this picture because this is actually, obviously, Iris pseudocorus, the ordinary marsh iris. Um, this is a real puzzle for a bee to get into one of these uh, plants. If you can see, you know how on an iris the fall goes down like that, and then there are the standards that are raised. And in fact, the nectaries are way down the bottom, right? And I've noticed the bumblebees can manage it, but I've almost never seen a honeybee on it. And this is because, of course, the bumblebees, a lot of the bumblebees have considerably longer tongues than our bees. But I love that picture because I'm very, very fond of my little ginger bees. <laughs> Everybody knows this echium. Actually, I was lucky with this echium. This is um, Pride of Madeira, and I was given the plant. Pride of Madeira is not hardy. A lot of the native echiums, the one that's, that goes under the name of bugle as our wildflower, is completely hardy. But this flowered for me very, very well and did as it's supposed to do. And it doesn't go up to 10 feet. It just is a shrub. Now, it's quite a large shrub, but it has a lot of, a lot of heads of flowers, um, sort of somewhat conical <coughs> heads of flowers. And it's uh, been very, very popular with the bees, of course. So that's Echium pride of Madeira. Or if you live in a cold place, just plant bugle. <laughs> ah. Couldn't believe my eyes with this one. Have you ever seen a honeybee bothering with euphorbia? This is euphorbia griffithii, fire glow. And again, I'm in April now, end of April, coming towards May. Euphorbias are not particularly good for bees, but they're very ornamental, and I do like them, so I grow them. She rambles around. What I couldn't believe, of course, was that fire glow, which is red, really red, would even attract a bee. And this is, I put this slide in quite simply to say, don't be worried. The bees will find. Don't be worried about what you're planting. The bees will find what you provide for them. As long as you don't plant plants which have absolutely no pollen and no nectar, which are F1 hybrids, and they grow in the garden centers like mad. So there's your warning. Those wretched bedding plants avoid. <laughs> and there's euphorbia to prove they will surprise you going into a red plant. These, uh, the next series, are all geranium, native geranium, which is immensely easy. Again, seeds itself around, hybridizes like mad. So you start with a purple one, and then some of the seeds will come up white. That's actually cashmere white. They're very, very nice plants. I'm going to zip through them, because I'm sure I'm taking too long. Oh, God, I couldn't identify this. 
I'm a member of a, of a group that distributes plant seeds, right? So I always plant the seed and then lose the labels. And I did that with this. And I thought, why? I can't identify this plant. What the hell is it? I've never seen it. When did I plant it? And the next thing was, I looked it up and realized that it's actually a form of Phacelia. No wonder it was so popular with the bees. Phacelia bolanderi. Again, hardy as nails, flowers for a short while, but in a way, it's uh, just a variation. All Phacelias, pH, Phacelia, all of those are very popular with bees. These are just in your herb garden somewhere. Herbs of all sorts are brilliant for bees. They love herbs, just the same as ourselves. I told you about the little euglossine bee picking up scent. They pick up the essential oils from the herbs. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, yes. Another one that'll take your garden over if you're not, not careful. The bellflower, campanula, the nettle leafed, nettle leaf campanula, a nice plant. It's worth having a few. You can have that in the bed underneath your shrubs because it doesn't mind. Um, it, that's on the, a lot of the things I'm showing you in this summer section are really pretty well English wildflowers in a garden variety. This, for example, is Malva Moscata, which is the scented mallow. Again, can we zoom in on the bee, please? Have you ever seen a bee happier to collect pollen? Look at that. Malva Moscata is a darling plant for that. Another geranium. This one is a deer and is worth getting the right one. This is Mrs. Kendall Clark. And as you can see, she's a very delicate lady. Again, the bees just quite simply adore, and she will seed herself <coughs> around. You never have to buy another packet of seed. Another one, this is later in the year. This is Geranium andresii. Um, that's a particularly washed out picture. It's a little more pink than that. That is a brilliant ground clover plant. Stick it under your shrubs and trees. You get flower below, flower above. <coughs> Absolutely. There's Mrs. Kendall Clark again. And I'm going, I'm flying along. Ah. Oh. oh, I should hang my head in shame here. This is actually not in my garden. Um, but it is the, the dreaded rose bay willow herb. I don't advise you to get a plant of this. <laughs> there are nicer epilobiums. There are very nice ones, actually. Uh, there's a lovely yellow flowered one called firecracker, I think, with dark leaves, which is a deer, and is manageable in your garden and just as popular. But I was out in the countryside and I quite simply was delighted to see that the honeybees were really using the rose bay willow herb. So I thought it was worthwhile to tell you how many of the flowers that just plant themselves in the woods where I walk, there, there are uh, resources for the bees. You know those commons, as I, um, I've just come from Richmond this morning and drove along the old Portsmouth Road. I was brought up in Kingston originally and it's all familiar land to me. And I, I was looking at the commons, and I was so relieved when we finally came out towards Isha, and Isha Common is actually quite wild, whereas Ham Common is completely manicured. I couldn't believe it. We used to play there. Never mind. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, this was showing off that there were two bees. <laughs> yes. Thalictrum. This is meadow rue, obviously, and that one is called flavum, the yellow form. Any of the thalictrums, and for the same reasons, look at the number of ways in for the bee, right? Each one of those will have a reward at the base. Yes. Okay. Ah, you may not know this. Um, this is a plant I fell in love with in Kew. It's actually uh, a later flowering. This doesn't really come into flower until July. You see, I've more or less done June with all those nice uh, herbaceous, right? And everything's flowering at that time anyway, it's no problem. But as we're coming into July, end of the June gap, as we're coming through to the autumn, it is harder to get the volume of flowers. Lipia citriodora, this is called. Uh, lemon verbena is another name for it. The leaves are str smell strongly of lemon and they make beautiful tea. Um, so it's a kind of half herb. It is actually a shrub. Now, I don't think that it's fully hardy. In Kew, they have it growing up against a wall. In my garden, which I moved into, as I say, nearly 40 years ago, there was already one growing, an old one. 
This, I found, comes easily from cuttings. The, um, the little flowers. <laughs> <laughs> the little flowers are also sweetly scented, and again, it's nice to have the odd sprig in the house. So that's Lipia, or in fact, it's been renamed, I think, botanically as Alo Aloysia, um, Lipia citriodora, or Aloysia citriodora. As I said, I've got all these names on a list for you, which I'll give to you. So here I am back in the herbs. This is another cedar around. This is such a strong grower that it grows in the lawn. Brian occasionally mows the lawn and usually mows out a few of these, right? This is a really tall um, salvia, obviously. It's, it's a, a real thug. And as you will have noticed, I love thugs. Um, this is Forskaloei. And I took this picture to show you that, in fact, the bumblebee hanging on by one claw has actually already loaded up her pollen sacs. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a long flower. It's still in flower in the garden, actually, oddly. Quite late this year. Now, as you know, I'm into August. Here is, everybody knows this favorite of the bees, Echinops retro, globe thistle. Um, always adored by the bees. That's uh, Bombus leucorum, I think, on that for the minute. Malva muscata alba. Flowers a little later than my pink one. This is the white uh, version. Again, absolutely wonderful for pollen. Also good for nectar. Virtually a wildflower, really. But nice enough to grow in the garden. And the leaves are attractive. They're well, well shaped. Nice plant. Yes, here I'm into my preaching to you about thistles. Thistles are good. <laughs> As you can see. Can I zoom in on my bee there? And for the same reason as the dandelions. And for the same reason that we hate the seeds, right? Now, I'm not suggesting you should grow thistles in your garden. But, but you can grow these giant thistles, artichokes. If you grow artichokes, you are your, your bee's best friend. They adore it. What I was finding that day, I had to stand, because the artichokes are pretty tall, I had to stand on a flower pot. I was a little precarious, actually, to get the photographs. And I couldn't get what I really wanted, which was to be able to show you it from above. Because inside all that thistle, there are a number of bees all foraging, right? There was one just popping out. Obviously, she'd had enough for the moment. Grow artichokes if you love your bees. <laughs> Still in the countryside, bramble. Now we're coming to the end of the year. As we know, this is the best late crop. And this is my moment for preaching to you about hedgerows. We've had major hedgerows, uh, a, a major hedgerow campaign in Ireland. I think we're winning. We are insisting that they may not be cut until the end of August, which is pretty minimal, actually. I would really like to see some of the hedgerows restored in Britain. I know you have lost a huge volume of hedgerows. I really would like, I think, beekeepers, we should get on and get people to replant hedgerows. It's easy enough to do. These are not plants that cost very much, right? And you can lay the, the trees along. Get into hedgerows. Ah, oh, now this cannot be called a wildflower. But she does flower late. This is Eucryphia nymansensis, and it is uh, a tree, actually, and it's, it's a very nice shape. It's sort of columnar. And one of the things I love about it is that it, it is flower from the base to the, to the crown. It has so much flower on it that it attracts the bees from everywhere. Um, it is sweetly scented, but it's a light scent. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be picking it. Um, so this is probably not 100% hardy. If you've been in Nyman's, if you've been down to Sussex and been in Nyman's, you'll have seen it there, of course. <coughs> this is their hybrid. But it is such a beautiful. And any Eucryphia is a favorite with the bees. But they are Antipodean plants, so they're not really necessarily hardy if you're in a cold place. Echinops still flowering its boots off, this time with a bumblebee. <laughs> and she's managed to avoid the traps. Still flowering, you know this, Russian sage, Perovskia. This is Perovskia blue spire. 
and what everybody knows. Yes? Tell me what it is. Verbena, yes, this is right. Bonariensis. This is another plant you'll never be without if you let it seed. It'll just go. I was particularly pleased with that photograph, as you can see. I'm a terrible photographer. I take about 40 every time, and one comes out. This was the one. <laughs> and it is my lovely little ginger bee, Bombus pasquorum, and I call the picture coming into land. <laughs> yes, with her tongue out ready. So that's flowering now still. I'm sure you've seen it on waste ground as well. It is beautiful. It had a sort of fashion a couple of years ago, didn't it? And all the fashionable gardens had it in as well. It's a lovely plant. Mm. <coughs> this is just about finished flowering now in my garden. And this is really not hardy. But this is a beautiful, I think of it as a sort of Victorian lily. It's crinum, and this is crinum powellii. Powell, Powell's crinium, powellii. And I was quite surprised, because on the whole, I don't find that lilies attract the bees very much. Um, but I was quite surprised at that time, this bee must have decided that she was going for nectar. And it's quite interesting, you can see what an extraordinary construction there is of that flower. The pollen-bearing anthers are a place that she has to pass to get back to the nectaries. And I think that's so interesting. Whereas the stigma, which is raised and above, which needs the pollen, is put out of the way so that the plant doesn't pollinate itself. And this is one of those very, very interesting things about the whole process of evolution, is that the way that the plants have encouraged kinds of pollinating which actually enable them to diversify their own genetic base. So just as our bees brilliantly with haplodiploidy have managed to get so many different genetic strains in the one colony, so also the plants look after, bio, uh, look after the biodiversity and the need for genetic diversity by raising their little pistol out of the range of what the insect would bring as she came out, yes. This, of course, is flowering now. I, I like this one. Um, actually, let's zoom in on that, because I will make a comment. And I will also acknowledge that the comment I'm about to make was made by a close friend of mine who is here. This is, obviously, fuchsia and its uh, particular Magell Magellaniana. Ugh, I'll get that right in a minute. Um, and it's just the pale version. Very common plant, very easy, not a bit of difficulty. But the good thing about this is that in wet weather, and here we are in the autumn, remember what it was like yesterday, <laughs> the pollen doesn't wash out. You can see that the nectar and pollen are protected by the form of the flower. And again, this is part of the cleverness of the flowers. I have another picture to show you, which is very similar principle. That's it. This is also the same. This is flowering now in my garden. This is not a hardy plant. This is a butylon, which I grew as a house plant, stuck it out in the garden against a wall, and it likes it, right? I love it, and I love it because it is in flower right into, um, really, until the frost kills it. Um, it is a butylon. Um, which one is it? I've forgotten, but anyway, it doesn't matter. But you can see the same principle. The bee can collect either pollen or nectar, Though at the minute they're just going in for the nectar, which I thought was interesting. They're collecting pollen elsewhere. Um, that day, if you look at that plant, that was a few, few days ago, that was in heavy rain. <laughs> look at those drops. And the bee had still found a way of getting to the, the nectar, which had not been diluted by the rain. Of course, plants restore the nectar afterwards, but it takes a while. If you're hungry and you're a bee, you look for a plant which is hanging down like that. That's a bell. So there you are. I'm back to my lavender. It's still flowering. That poor Bombus pasquorum is trying to find something on it. You can see the miserable cold weather has made the plant less happy. It's not as cheerful as it was in January, <laughs> oddly enough. But there she is, putting her tongue in and making sure she gets something. And I'm now on to unashamedly wild plants and my plea for you to enable the uh, 
parks and gardens actually to have wild areas. They are so adorable, <laughs> and you can enjoy them so much. They're ragwort. How can she stand there and say, let ragwort be? It used to be a notifiable plant. Yes, it did. But look what's there. There's Lombus, Bombus lapidarius, the red-tailed bumblebee. I've seen so many bumblebees foraging on ragwort. I don't like to see honeybees because the honey doesn't taste nice, you know. But never mind. <laughs> Out in the country, I think there's room for ragwort. Don't just pull it up everywhere. And the next one, I'm back to my thistles. Pleading for thistles. Didn't I say bees adore thistles? I've got two different types of bee on the one thistle, which is actually a little unusual. You have to wait around for that. Um, it's the ordinary scrub thistle, taken on scrubland. And again, I've got Lapidarius on the right and my little ginger bee, Pasquorum, on the left. And my final slides. That I have as my screensaver. <laughs> And I was just delighted to get that. That's one of my favorite pictures. That's where I live. I walk my dog there every other day. Aren't I lucky? <laughs> it's a lovely, lovely place. And I absolutely adore the fact that I can see the wild bees. Um, I ought to say I've not had a chance to mention the solitary bees, but remember the solitary bees and the bumblebees. If you have an area under your hedge which is all dry and messy old leaves and bits of stick, that's ideal for bumblebees. If you have one of those clumps of grass that you can never mow because it's so tough, that's ideal for my Bombus pasquorum. She's a carder bee. She weaves her nest out of bits of grass. Leave places for the wild bees. Leave places for the solitary bees. Now, I'll, I'll start this question with an apology, Mary, because I didn't get here until about 10 o'clock because of the traffic. So I might have missed this, but if you had a top 10 for beekeepers, bearing in mind what we need, what would your top 10 be? And I'm sorry if that protracts everything. No, that's fine. And I, I certainly haven't a top 10. But I would make two or three very simple, very simple recommendations. Plant a flowering tree. A flowering tree gives more flowers per square foot than anything else. And they are so rewarding anyway to the gardener. Um, so if you don't have room for a horse chestnut, think of planting some smallish tree. My little amelanchia would do. But also, all the rowans, the beautiful rowans with the berries in the autumn, they're so lovely now. Think of planting a small native tree which flowers. That will cover that. Second recommendation. If you're not planting trees, plant shrubs. Same principle. And third recommendation, if you're not planting shrubs and you're not planting trees, make sure you're not using any pesticides of any sort at all, including slug pellets. And secondly, make sure that you don't buy F1s. They have no nectar and no pollen. There's my rant. And finally, try to plant plants which have cluster heads or panicles, lilac or a panicle. I have a lovely tree called Colrotiria uh, paniculata, which has long panicles of yellow flowers, like, viburnum, like uh, laburnum, really. But this is actually a golden rain tree. It's um, in July to August. So again, it's a very good time for the bees to like it. They're pea-shaped flowers. So it's a, a favorite with the bees. So let me recommend. Plant a tree. If you can't plant a tree, plant a shrub. And if you can't plant a shrub, then make sure you plant things with lots and lots of flowers on them. <laughs> All right. Many beekeepers would probably just go to the ordinary garden centre to buy things. Yes. And some of the plants that you've shown, I'm sure, would probably need them to go to specialist nurseries. No. No. I don't think so. I'm, I'm pretty sure that almost everything that I've shown you, the, all the herbaceous would be easy from seed. And there are seeds available everywhere. Um, there are seed, you could even, if you're feeling really flush, you could even buy the heritage seeds for this kind of thing. They're ideal. A number of the shrubs, uh, now you're right that Daphne Bulua might cost you something. But you don't have to buy a big one, <laughs> right? You don't have, 
And furthermore, don't buy a big tree. Buy a tree which will grow. Buying a tree this size, you will have more growth on that in two years than if you buy one this size. So for goodness sake, be mean. <laughs> buy the cheap ones. <laughs> buy the ones which are easy. I really don't think there's anything that I've shown you that I haven't made a note of. The, uh, the other exception would be the Eucryphia. The Eucryphia, which is possibly a more expensive plant. But again, I actually think I paid five pounds for mine. Go to a plant sale. <laughs> Gardeners are just as mean as beekeepers. <laughs> what would you do if um, someone gave you a very fashionable little packet of wildflower seeds? If somebody gave me a very fashionable packet of wildflower seeds, I would say thank you very, very much, but I already have plenty of wildflowers. <laughs> and I know that wildflower packets are a bit of a snare and a delusion. Because if there's one thing that real wildflowers, like your corn cockles, those lovely ragworts, those little, not ragworts, the little ragged robins, those lovely little plants, they thrive in quite ungardeny conditions. If you have a garden, somebody or you have been putting fertilizer into that garden periodically or using good compost, and the ground will not be poor enough for the wildflowers to flourish. These are not, they are, remember what I was saying about coevolution and the niches that the plants achieve in the environment. Wildflowers have niches. They are not the easiest things to grow, and I would warn you, just grow degraded garden plants like me.